Chapter 8. I am giving birth to you, my angel. Victor Chadov, an entrepreneur, awoke at dawn. His girlfriend lay beside him in the big bed, still asleep. The thin blanket hugged the contours of her delicate figure. Every time they attended formal receptions together or went to some fancy resort hotel, her body attracted men's envious or lustful glances. Not only that, but Inga, as the sleeping beauty was called, possessed a most charming smile and gave the impression on those around her of being a smart and educated woman. Victor took such great pleasure in her company that he bought a second four-bedroom flat, furnished it with ultra-modern pieces, and gave Inga the keys. Occasionally, if his intensive business schedule allowed, he would spend a night or two with her. He was grateful to this twenty-five-year-old woman for these marvelous nights they spent together, and the opportunity to chat with her. But he had no plans to marry her. He had no special feelings of love for her, and besides, he knew which side his bread was buttered on. After all, he was thirty-eight, and she twenty-five. Naturally, it would not be long before this young woman would start hankering for a younger man, and with her body and brains, that would not be too difficult to find, and she would find a younger and even richer man, all thanks to him. After all, if he married her, he would also be introducing her to a circle of influential businessmen. Inga turned her face toward him, smiling in her sleep. The blanket had slipped down just enough to expose one of her alluring, so perfectly shaped feminine breasts. But this time, Victor Chadov experienced none of his usual stimulation at the sight of her half-naked body. He carefully replaced the blanket on his sleeping partner. Silently, trying not to wake her, he got up from the bed and headed out to the kitchen. He made some coffee and poured himself a cup. Lighting a cigarette, he began pacing the spacious breakfast room floor, practically oblivious to his surroundings. What a dream! His feelings were still aroused by last night's extraordinary dream. Yes, his feelings rather than his mind. Victor had dreamt that he was walking along a shady alley, concentrating on the feasibility of a routine commercial deal. Behind and in front of him walked his bodyguards. He was irritated at their presence and had a hard time concentrating. His attention was also distracted by the constant noise of traffic along the edge of the park. Then, all of a sudden, his bodyguards disappeared, and the traffic noise died down. And he could hear the birds singing. He could see the marvelous spring foliage on the trees, on the trees lining the alley, and the flowers on the bushes. He stopped and delighted in the soft and pleasant feelings welling up inside him, and he felt better than he ever had before in his life. And all at once he noticed, far down the alley, a little boy running toward him. The sunlight was shining from behind, giving him a kind of halo. And it almost seemed as though here running toward him was a little angel. A moment later, and it dawned on him that this was none other than his own little son. The lad's hands and feet were in constant energetic motion. With a joyful premonition, Victor squatted down and threw open his arms to embrace him while his little son in turn threw open his arms on the run. But then, all at once, the boy stopped in his tracks about three meters shy of Victor. The smile faded from the youngster's face, and the look in his eyes made Victor's heart start to pound. Come on, come on, come to me. Come and let me hug you, son. The boy answered with a wry smile. There is no way you can do that, Papa. Why not? Victor asked in surprise. Because, answered the boy with a tone of sadness, you can't hug me, Papa, because you can't hug a son which hasn't been born. After all, you, did, you didn't give birth to me, Papa. Then you come and hug me, son. Come on. I can't hug a father who didn't give birth to me. The boy tried to smile through his tears. A tear was already trickling down his red cheek. Then the boy turned, hung his head, and slowly wandered off down the alley. But Victor was still standing there on his knees, rooted to the spot. The boy kept getting further and further away, as did the soft and pleasant feelings Victor had had a moment ago. Once again, from the distance, it seemed he could hear the roar of traffic, 
Unable to move, Victor summoned up his remaining strength and called out, Don't leave me! Where are you going, son? The youngster turned, and he could see another tear trickling down his face. I'm going into the nowhere, Papa, into the infinite nowhere. Again the lad hung his head without saying a word. Then he added, I'm sad, Papa. I'm sad that I wasn't born, and so I cannot restore your life with myself. With head lowered, the little angel receded into the distance and presently disappeared, literally dissolving in the sun's rays. The dream ended, but the impressions of the marvelous, soft, and pleasant sensations lingered on. It was as though they were summoning Victor to take action. After finishing his third cigarette, Victor extinguished it firmly and decisively. He rushed into the bedroom, calling out loudly on the way, "'Wake up, Inga, wake up!' I'm not asleep, answered the beautiful girl from the bed, just lying here, lolling about. I've been wondering where you were, where you disappeared to. Inga, I want to have a child. Could you have a son with me? She threw off the blanket and leapt out of bed. She ran over to him, flung her arms around his neck, and pressed against him with every inch of her supple and beautiful body. And then, in a hot whisper, she confided, the most delightful and beautiful declaration of love is when a man asks a woman to bear his child. Thank you, that is, if you're not joking. I'm not joking, he replied firmly. Putting on a bathrobe, Inga responded, Well, if you're not joking, if you're serious, that is, this is a decision we need to think through. First, I want my future child to have a father, but you, my dearly beloved, are still married. I will get a divorce, Victor promised. In fact, he had already divorced his wife three months before, but for a variety of reasons had not yet told Inga the news. Once you get your divorce, then we can start talking about a child. But I'll tell you right off, Victor, even if you get divorced, it's still too early to think about children. In the first place, Inga reasoned, half in jest, half serious, I still need a year to finish graduate school. Secondly, I'm so tired of studying that once I finish, I'd like to take another year just to fool around, make the rounds of a few resorts, and have a good time. So if you're talking about a child, well, children could put an end to that little plan once and for all. Okay, I was joking, Victor interrupted her rambling train of thought. I've got to go. I've got an important meeting coming up. I've already called for my car. So long. He left, but it was not for any meeting and he had not called any car. Victor walked slowly down the sidewalk, giving the once-over to every woman he met. He was viewing them through new eyes, a view he himself was not accustomed to. He was trying to pick out a woman who might be worthy of bearing him a son, a woman he felt he could have a child with. Immediately, all the stylish girls with heavy makeup who had earlier attracted his attention fell away. He had completely lost interest in all the girls who dressed in tight-fitting clothes or semi-nude in mini bikini tops to show off their figure. It's clear why they do that. It's what's on their mind, he thought to himself. And then they try putting an intelligent expression on their face. They use their various body parts to attract men, and maybe someone will bite. And when And they do bite, of course, only not to have kids. It's a bite for a shag, no procreation there. Go on, dummies, wiggle your behinds. I'm not going to let any wigglers like that have my child. Two girls he happened to notice coming towards him were smoking as they walked, and one of them was holding in her hand an open bottle of beer. Now they're the kind that are absolutely no good for having children. Only an idiot would want to have a child with that sort. Another thing Victor noticed was that very few of the women and girls he saw were really healthy looking. Some were slouching, others had an expression on their face that made them look as though they were suffering from stomach cramps. Still, others showed definite signs of either obesity or anorexia. No, it wouldn't do to have children with them, Victor thought to himself. Wow, it looks like every one of these women is dreaming of a prince sli sidling up to them in a white Mercedes. And yet, they themselves couldn't do the most basic thing of all for that prince. In their own unhealthy state, they couldn't possibly give him a healthy child. Victor did not bother to call his driver. 
Instead, he went on to his office on the trolley bus, still looking up and down. Every woman his eyes fell upon, trying to find among their number one who was worthy to bear his child, but to no avail. All day long, including during his lunch break and when he was alone in his office, he could not stop thinking about the woman who was going to give him a son. At times, he had the impression of looking for a woman he himself could be born from. At long last, he came to a conclusion. If an ideal partner could not be found, she would have to be created. For this, he would need to find a more or less healthy young woman with an attractive, or at least not repulsive, appearance. One with good character and arrange for her to have all sorts of training and health improvement exercises in the best sanatoriums. But the main thing would be to send her off to be tutored in a top educational institution, one where she could learn all about preparing for pregnancy, carrying the child to term, and the birthing process itself, as well as basic preschool education. At the end of his working day, he called in his firm's lawyer, Valentina Petrovna, a woman who had been made wiser by the school of hard knocks. He invited her to have a seat and began a roundabout way. I have a bit of an unusual question for you, Valentina Petrovna. It's rather personal, but it's very important to me. A cousin of mine asked me to make an inquiry for her. Anyway, she's planning on getting married soon, and she asked me to find out where she can locate an educational institution in our country for women to study up on the best way to carry their pregnancy, as well as what the birth process and subsequent, chi subsequent child raising involves, and what the role of the father should be in this. Valentina Petrovna listened intently. When he finished... She thought for a while before saying, As you know, Viktor Nikolaevich, I have two children, and I've always been interested in literature on birthing and the raising of children, but I've never heard of that kind of school, either in our country or abroad. Strange, they teach everything nowadays, and yet this most important issue isn't touched either by our high schools or our post-secondary institutions. I wonder why. Yes, it is strange, Valentina Petra. Petrovna agreed. I've never really thought about it before, but now this state of affairs does seem strange to me. The state Duma, it looks like, doesn't shy away from discussing the topic of sex education in the schools, but the question of teaching how to give birth and bring up children isn't even raised. That means that every couple is obliged to experiment on their own child? That's what it boils down to, replied Valentina Petrovna. An experiment. There are, of course, a wide variety of courses teaching parents what to do at birthing time, how to handle newborns, but there is no scientific basis underlying the process, and it's pretty nigh impossible to decide which courses are really going to help and which are harmful. Did you take any courses yourself, Valentina Petrovna? Well, for our younger daughter, I decided on a home birth, in the bathtub, with the help of a midwife. A lot of women are doing that today. People believe that it's more comfortable for a child to make its appearance in the world, in a home environment, in the presence of family. They say newborns can tell when people treat them with love as opposed to just simply indifference, which is what you get in many maternity wards. It's like a conveyor belt there, after all. Victor did not find his conversation with Valentina Petrovna all that encouraging. In fact, it depressed him. For two whole weeks, he spent all his free time thinking about the problem of childbirth. For two whole weeks, as he walked about the city on foot, visiting high-class restaurants, bars, and theaters, he would give probing looks into women's faces. He even went out into the countryside, but could not find anyone suitable for him there either. One day, he parked his jeep near a teacher's college and peered through the jeep's tinted glass windows at the girls passing by. After three hours, he noticed a young woman coming down the steps with her hair tied back in a short, light brown braid. She had a stately figure and, as it seemed to him, an intelligent-looking face. As she walked past his jeep on the way to the bus stop, Victor rolled down his window and hailed her. "'Excuse me, miss. Please. You see, I've been waiting for my friend here, and I can't wait any longer. 
If you could show me the best route to the center of town, I'd be happy to give you a lift home after that, if you like. The girl looked at the jeep, assessing the situation, and then quietly answered, Sure, why not? I'll show you. After she got into the front seat and they had introduced themselves, the, go the girl pointed to the pack of cigarettes on the dashboard and said, You got some nice cigarettes there. Mind if I have a smoke? Help yourself, replied Victor. He was just as glad when his mobile phone rang at, the mo at that moment. No important message, but when he hung up, Victor put on a worried face and told the girl, who by now was aggressively puffing on a cigarette, Something's come up. I've got to get to an urgent business meeting. You'll have to excuse me. With that, he left the girl out on the sidewalk, cigarette in hand, after deciding there was no way he was going to let his son be poisoned by tobacco smoke. All during these two weeks, Victor did not meet with his girlfriend at all. He did not even ring her up. He had decided that if she did not want to have a child with him, if all she wanted to do was have a good time and hang around fancy resorts, he had no use for her. Certainly, it had been fun spending time with this beautiful and intelligent woman, but now his life plans had taken a completely different turn. I'll leave her the flat, Victor decided. After all, this woman, this woman did spice up my life for a while. He headed over to the university Inga attended to give her his keys to the apartment. On the way there, he rang her up on his mobile. Hi, Inga. Hi, came the familiar voice over the telephone. Where are you now? I'm almost at your university. Will you be finished classes soon? I haven't gone to the university for ten days now. To tell you the truth, I can't see myself going back there any time soon. Something happened? Yeah. Where are you now? At home. When Victor opened the front door and entered the flat, Inga was lying on the bed in her bathroom and reading some kind of book. Glancing at Victor, she said without getting up, There's coffee and sandwiches in the kitchen and once more she buried her nose in the book. Victor went into the kitchen and took a couple of gulps of coffee. After lighting a cigarette, he plunked his keys down on the kitchen table and went back to the door in the bedroom, of the bedroom, where Inga was still reading as before. I'm leaving, he told her, maybe for quite a while or maybe for good. I'm leaving you the flat. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Hang loose. And with that, he headed toward the door. Inga caught up with him right in the doorway. Hey, wait a minute there, scamp, she said with an upbeat tone, tugging at Victor's sleeve. You're leaving me, eh? You turned my whole life upside down, and now it's goodbye? Now how have I turned your life upside down, Victor asked in surprise. You gave me a good time, and I bet it wasn't too bad for you either. You now have the flat all to yourself, and a closet full of clothes. Take good care of yourself. Have fun, the way you wanted to. Or is it more money you want? You know you really are a scamp. Come on, first you spit on my soul, and then you carry on about the flat clothes and having fun? Hey, take it easy. Don't make a scene. I've got important business to attend to. Goodbye. Victor reached for the door handle, but Inga once again held him back, gra grabbing hold of his arm. Not so fast, darling. Hold on a moment. There's something I want you to tell me. Did you ask me to bear you a child, or didn't you? I asked you, and you said no. Yeah, I said no at first, and then I thought about it for a couple of days and changed my mind. I quit graduate school, quit smoking, I work out every morning, and now I've got hold of these books about life and children. I can't put them down. Here I am reading up on the best way to have a child, and he says goodbye. I can't imagine anyone but you as the father of our... When Inga's words finally sunk in, Victor gave her a boisterous hug, whispering her name over and over again. Then he hoisted her in his arms and carried her into the bedroom tenderly. As though handling a most precious treasure, he laid her down on the bed and began tearing off his clothes. With greater passion than ever before, he embraced her as, he, as she lay on the bed. He began kissing her shoulders and breast, at the same time trying to remove her bathrobe. But all at once, his efforts met with a silent protest, and she started to push him away. "'Hey, calm down there, please,' Inga said to him. "'That's not the way. "'To put it in a nutshell, I'm not going to have sex with you today, or tomorrow, or a month from now.' "'What do you mean, no sex? "'Didn't you just tell me you agreed to have a child?' "'That's what I said, but how can you have a child without sex?' "'Sex should be something quite different, fundamentally different. "'How so?' 
Well, it's like this. Tell me, my dear, future, loving Papa, why do you want your child to be born? What are you talking about? Victor sat down on the bed in shock. Everybody knows why. There's no two ways about it. You're making yourself very clear, but still, let's be specific as to what you want and which way you want to go about it. Do you want your child to be born as a consequence, a side effect of your fleshy desires? Or of our joint fleshy desires, for that matter? Or would you rather see him as the desired offspring of our mutual love? I don't think a child would fancy being just a side effect. So then, the offspring of love. But you see, you're not in love with me. Sure, you find me attractive, but that's not the same as love. You're right, Inga. I find you very attractive. There, you see? And you're you're very attractive to me. But that's still a, way f- a ways from love. We have to earn each other's love. You must have been hitting some pretty strange reading material, eh, Inga? Love is a feeling. It comes all by itself from goodness knows where. And it disappears goodness knows where. You can earn somebody's respect, sure. But love... But it is precisely each other's love that we've got to earn, and our son will help us do it. Our son? You really feel we're going to have a son? Why going to? It's already a fact. Hey, what does that mean? Victor jumped up. Are you telling me you're already pregnant? You've been hiding it from me, eh? Whose child is it? How far along is it? It's yours, and it hasn't started yet. So it's not there yet at all? It is. Listen here, Inga. I really have no idea what you're on about. You're talking some sort of nonsense. Can you put it somehow more clearly? I'll try, you see, Victor. You got this desire to have a child, and you've begun thinking about it. Then I got the same desire, and I too began thinking about it. We know today that human thought is material. And that means if we both have a mental concept of our child, it already exists. And where is it now? I don't know. Maybe in some other dimension we don't know about. Maybe out there in some one of the galaxies of the universe he's running barefoot through the stars and looking down on this blue earth where he's going to get a material embodiment. Maybe he's now choosing the place and conditions he'd like to be born in, and he wants to let us know. Can you hear or feel what he's asking us? Victor looked at Inga wide-eyed, as though seeing her for the very first time. She had never come out with reasoning like this before. He could not make up his mind whether she was serious or simply joking. But that phrase, maybe he's now choosing where he'd like to be born, struck in his mind. People are born in all sorts of different places. Some are born in an airplane, on board ship, or in a motor car. Many are born in hospitals and maternity wards. Some at home in the bathtub. They are born wherever it works out for them to be born. But where would children like to be born. For example, he, Victor, if he had had the opportunity and the choice, where would he like to have been born? In Russia or one in one of the best hospitals in England or America? But none of these alternatives struck him as being a particularly appealing. Inga interrupted Victor's train of thought. I've already worked out a detailed plan for our joint preparation for meeting our son. What sort of plan? Listen to me carefully, my dear. Inga spoke decisively like never before, either sitting in an easy chair or pacing the floor. First, we've got to get ourselves in top-notch physical shape. From now on, we shan't smoke or drink. We have to do a thorough cleaning out of our insides, starting with the kidneys and liver, with the help of various teas and fasting. I've already selected a method. From now on, we shall drink only spring water. That's very important. I'm already having five liters of spring water delivered every day. Sure, it costs twice as much as in the stores, but never mind, we'll get by. Every day we need to do physical exercise to strengthen our muscles and intensify our blood circulation. We still need need fresh air and positive emotions, which are not all that easy to come by. Victor liked Inga's decisiveness, as well as her plan of action. Without giving her a chance to finish, he declared, We'll buy the best workout equipment for our physical exercises and hire the best masseurs. I can send one of my drivers to pick up spring water for us every day. The driver can also go and collect air from the forest. He can use a compressor to store it in cylinders under pressure, and then we can release it in the 
release the air in our flat a little at a time. Only I have no idea where we can get or buy positive emotions. Maybe we could go visit some fine resorts like on our honeymoon trip. I mean, I mean it. A honeymoon? Victor's mood was getting more and more upbeat by the minute, thanks to both Inga's decisive and careful thought thought through approach to childbirth and her desire to have a child by him. And he was glad to know that the son he had foreseen in his dream would be born not just by some flighty female interested mainly in money, but by Inga, who was talking such serious and responsible approach to the matter. He really wanted to do something nice for Inga, whom he already considered to be the mother of his future son. He got up quickly, put on a suit, walked up to Inga, and solemnly declared, Inga, will you marry me? Of course I will, Inga replied in accord, as she buttoned up her bathrobe. Our son should have official parents. Only there's no point in going to some fancy resort for a honeymoon. That doesn't fit in with my plan of preparation for a childbirth. What does fit in, then? Where else can we get positive emotions? We should go around the outlying villages and find a spot we both really like. It has to appeal to both of us, and that means it will appeal to our son, too, when he sees it. We'll buy a hectare of land there, and you will build a small house where our ch child's conception is to take place. I shall stay there all the nine months of my pregnancy, maybe with an occasional brief outing. We'll plant a new garden right there on our, on our very own plot of land. I shan't give birth in a hospital, but in the little house on our family domain. Victor could not believe his ears. He could not believe that Inga, a smart, glamorous woman who used to be so keen on hanging out at fashionable clubs and popular resorts, could have changed her whole way of life so radically. On the one hand, he was flattered by Inga's vision. After all, she had his child in mind. On the other hand, did not this vision harbor just a hint of abnormality? He had heard from one of his friends the existence of a series of books describing an unusual approach to childbirth. His friend had mentioned the importance of each family having their own hector of land, and had given him this little book with a green cover called The Book of Kin. He had not got round to reading it, but he had heard that these books had been stirring up quite a controversy among the public, who had... Uh, people who had read them were beginning to change their whole way of life. All at once, Victor's eyes fell on a pile of books with green covers lying on, on one of the bedside tables. He walked over and read the series title, Bringing Cedars of Russia. Among them was the Book of Kin. Victor now realized that all these unusual ideas Inga had about preparation for childbirth she had taken from these books, and she was getting ready to carry them out to the letter. He was still not quite sure whether this was good, was a good or a bad thing. There was something disturbing about Inga's unusual and unquestioning conviction. It was as though an invisible someone had changed her views and whole outlook on life. But had these books changed Inga for the better, or had they made her just a little quirky? Victor kept rehashing the question over and over in his mind, and began to argue with her. Inga, I know you got your ideas from these books. I've heard about them. Some people find them exciting. Others say there's a lot in them that's, sim that's simply fairy tale-ish and can't be proved. Maybe you shouldn't just automatically believe everything that's in them. Think about it. What's the point in taking a plot of land and building a little house and wearing ourselves out planting trees? I've got enough to buy us a fine mansion with landscaped grounds, a swimming pool, nice lawns, pathways, and a garden if that's what you want. There's a lot of things we could buy, of course, Inga blurted out very emotionally for some reason. Even a fast meal of love. But I want us to plant our garden ourselves, all by ourselves, because I want to be able to say that my, to my son that when he grows up. You see this apple tree, son, and that pear tree and the cherry tree? I planted and watered them myself when you were just a little tyke. I did that for you. You were oh so little, and these trees were oh so little. Now you've grown, and they've grown too, and they've begun to bear fruit for you. And I've tried to make the whole space around your little motherland nice and beautiful for you. Inga's outpouring of emotion was convincing, and Victor liked what he heard. He even noticed having regrets 
He even started having regrets that nobody in his lifetime had been able to take him to a garden like that and say, This tree here was planted and grown for you. By your parents. Yes, of course, Inga's right, thought Victor. Only why is she talking only about herself as if I don't exist? Feeling a bit slighted, he asked, Inga, why would you tell our growing son only about your part in this? Because you don't want to plant a garden, Inga calmly replied. What do you mean I don't want to? You bet I do, if it's important for our future. Well then, we're going to do everything together. I'll tell our son we planted this garden for him. That's more like it, Victor observed, comforted. For two months, Victor and Inga spent all their weekends driving around the outskirts of the city, looking for a place to build their future kin's domain. It was a most pleasant undertaking, and right at that time it seemed to Victor that there was no more important task in life than searching for the one place on the earth that would satisfy his soul, and consequently that of his future son. And so it happened one day that they came to the edge of a deserted village about thirty kilometers outside the city. There it is, Inga said quietly, jumping out of the car first. I feel something here too, responded Victor. Later, they made a second trip to the place and spent a whole day looking over the site and talking with the local residents. They were told that the soil was not all that fertile, as there was groundwater fairly near the surface. But that did not faze Victor. He became more and more persuaded that this particular land, along with the little birches growing on it, as well as the sky and clouds above it, that all this belonged to him, to him and his future son and to his and Inga's grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and if the ground was not all that fertile, no matter, he would make it fertile. It did not take long to draw up the documents to purchase two hectares of land, and after four short months the plot supported its own pretty, its own pretty, almost fairy tale cabin, built of kiln-dried logs. The cabin featured a sauna and a bio-toilet, along with hot and cold running water straight from a well dug on the spot. And on the second floor, a cozy bedroom with a window overlooking a forest and a lake. Inga designed the layout of the cabin with all its furnishings. She also came up with a plan for the landscaping. Together they planted cedars, firs, and pines around the perimeter of the lot, as well as little fruit tree saplings. Every evening, Victor would hurry home to his little cabin on his future domain, where the mother-to-be of his child was taking care of the home front. All the women Victor had known before not only receded into the background, they simply ceased to exist for him at all. Inga's radical approach to childbirth engendered new feelings in him. They were still not entirely clear to him, and they were probably quite different from traditional love but he was quite convinced that he could never part from her, and only she could bear. It was only with her that he could build a future. The two of them went into Moscow together to attend courses on home childbirths. There was one peculiarity of Inga's that Victor found disconcerting. Her outright refusal to have an intimate relations with him, she kept insisting that their child should not be born as a result of fleshy lusts, but from man's infinitely greater and more meaningful desire, which was something else again. Now this time, the author of these little green books has gone too far, thought Victor. Come on, could it really be possible to do away with the factor of flesh desire completely? But one day, as he laid beside Inga on the bed, not having any kind of sex in mind, but thinking only of his future son, he touched her breasts. Inga at once pressed against him and put her arms around him. In the morning, while Inga was still asleep, Victor headed over to the lake. The world around him seemed entirely different. It seemed unusual and joyful. What had happened the previous night he had never experienced before, either with Inga or with any other woman he had known. This was no ordinary sex. It was an inspired impulse of creativity. Of course, people are born and people die, but if they never experience anything like this over their whole lifetime, they are missing something. Maybe the most important thing, but thanks to Inga, it did not escape Victor, and he began to experience new, warm, yeah, fervent feelings toward the one woman in his life, Inga. 
All nine months of her pregnancy Inga spent on the domain. Going into town only occasionally, she had it all worked out where the baby pram would be kept and where the crib would stand. She even had Victor plant a modest-sized lawn where she could walk with her little son. Her contractions began a week ahead of the expected time. Their future son was apparently anxious to make his appearance in, this, in his marvelous space on the earth. From the information they had received during their childbirth courses, Victor knew what a father should do to assist during the labor. But the only rational thing he turned out to be capable of accomplishing was to ring up the midwife they knew and call for an ambulance to stand by in case of emergency. Inga had to draw the water in the bathtub herself, prepare the towel, and measure the water temperature, while he paced the room trying to think of what he should be doing but could not for the life of him recall what it was. With no husbandly help to count on, Inga climbed into the bathtub on her own. The contractions continued, but each time one occurred, she simply drew upon her beautiful voice to sound forth on notes of joy and triumph. Finally, out of all he had learnt during the courses, Victor managed to remember one thing, positive emotions. He glanced over at the windowsill and saw the flower Inga had planted in a pot there, now in full bloom. He grabbed the flower pot and ran with it into the bathroom, exclaiming excitedly over and over again, Look, Inga, your flower's blooming, your flower's blooming, it's come out, just look. He was standing there holding the flower pot when his son's little body appeared in the bathtub. The midwife arrived only after Inga had already placed the tiny body on her tummy. Seeing Victor standing there holding the flower pot, she snapped. And just what are you doing? I'm giving birth to a son, replied Victor. Ah, the midwife nodded in agreement. Then put your pot back on the window sill and bring me. I need to tell all men, thought Victor as he ran about the house for the umpteenth time. True and lasting love comes only when together with your beloved you give birth to a long-desired child. Chapter 9. A Fine State of Affairs A Fine State of Affairs We live out our lives and we don't even try to figure out what our society is all about. And yet it is one of the most important questions in life. It's one that's troubled me for a long time now. I really wanted Anastasia to have a look at the documents on the building of the domains which I had brought with me, along with my appeal to the President of Russia and the draft legislation drawn up by my readers. After thinking it over, however, I decided not to show these documents to Anastasia. I didn't want to risk upsetting her, especially now if it turns out she's pregnant. She needs positive and not negative emotions. I finally decided to give the whole packet of documents to Anastasia's grandfather and ask him for his opinion. Oh ho! exclaimed grandfather as he took the voluminous packet from my outstretched hands and remarked, What do you want me to do, Vladimir? Read all this? Yeah, I want to hear your opinion about them, about how things have turned out. And what good would that do you? It would help me decide what course of action to follow. You ought to be deciding your own course of action without any kind of advice. Does that mean you're not willing to read these? All right, I'll read them, So, just so you won't take offense. I shan't take offense. What sense is there in reading if you're obviously reluctant to do so? Sense? The sense is, not, is in not wasting time on useless stuff. Grandfather sat down on the ground beneath the cedar, opened the folder, and began leafing through the pages, taking his time. Occasionally his gaze would pause and focus on a particular page. Sometimes he just kept turning the pages with a passing glance. After a while he said, Vladimir, I need to look at everything carefully. Why don't you go take a walk in the meantime? I walked about twenty-five meters off and began pacing back and forth, waiting for him to finish reading the documents. I had brought with me, including the articles prepared for the almanac. I would like to share these with you too, dear readers. Talking with Presidents Please tell me, esteemed sirs, all you presidents, prime ministers and chancellors, who in fact is in control of nation-states. 
The question may seem strange at first glance. Any school child will offer the reply. Countries are under the control of the President, the Government, the Duma. But an answer like that simply points to the extent of mass illusion at work here, and not just in our country. All sorts of ordinary people are under the spell of this illusion, just like the rulers themselves. It can and must be dispelled with, with the aid of logical thinking. Those who are unable to discern the illusory, illusoriness engendered upon the earth will die without having really lived, because the whole of their so-called life is but an illusion. And so, how to dispel this illusion? First of all, we should define what it means to control a nation. In the main, and perhaps exclusively, this refers to the control of social processes and phenomena. The chief person in this control system is called a president. So let's ask him. Tell us, please, Mr. President, are you in charge of drug addiction in our country? No, the president will reply, I'm not in charge of that. What about the rapid development of prostitution? No, I'm not in charge of that either. And what about widespread corruption and bribery? No. And the extinction of our population? What are you talking about? I'm not in charge of anybody's extinction. There are a whole lot of questions which he would have to answer with the phrase, No, I'm not in charge of it. He has, in fact, no alternative, since giving any other answer would brand the ruler as a criminal. So it turns out that there are unmistakable, large-scale processes taking place in society, influencing the lives of every single individual. But the supreme ruler and the whole host of officials under his command have nothing to do with these processes. What, then, are they, in fact, in charge of? Upon closer inspection, all they do, it turns out, is un involuntary and unwittingly supervise the concealment of the true rulers, who, you see, really do have reason to hide. In any case, no president chancellor or prime minister can possibly be the real ruler of a nation, either in theory or in practice. Their only task is to carry out someone else's will under the guise of their own, and this can be attested by scholars, psychologists, for example. You and I can come to a similar conclusion if we make a careful ana analysis of our own lives. Haven't our own lives been influenced by someone, say, in kindergarten, school, or college? If they want to, they can bring us up to be communists or fascists or democrats, as in our present situation. And through this process of upbringing and indoctrination, they engender the corresponding social processes. Reality should be determined only through one's own self, Anastasia has said. Her words are good and true, but to understand reality, we need to reflect, contemplate. However, our prevalent way of life leaves precious little time for reflection. And so, by default, we use someone else's definition of reality that has been imposed on us. In the case of a head of state, he has even less time for reflection than ordinary people. His daily schedule is calculated down to the hour and minute, and often not by himself. History also teaches us the impossibility of a universe, universally visible ruler actually controlling a nation-state. It is known, for example, that in ancient Egypt the pharaoh was raised by priests. Naturally, they knew in advance what many of the pharaoh's future decisions would be. But even during the tenure of his reign, they would still keep giving him advice. So, in actual fact, the pharaoh was merely carrying out somebody else's will. Rulers in the Orient also had wise men at their courts and consulted with them. But neither the Egyptian priests, nor the Oriental court wise men, nor the sages of our Vedras period ever burdened themselves with affairs of state. Their principal task was that of analysis and reflection. Not affording such an opportunity to our present rulers and parliamentarians renders them incapable of exerting an effective influence on the processes taking place in society. It deprives them of power. This was confirmed to me by a well-known three-term deputy of the Legislative Assembly, who is also a professor with a PhD in economics. But he confirms this only after serving his par parliamentary terms, when he finally had the opportunity to engage in reflection and analysis. 
It was confirmed in the scandalous incident reported in the press when a deputy of the President Duma of the present Duma complained to the Constitutional Court that the President's Deputy Chief of Staff advised a group of State Duma representatives in no uncertain terms not to reason things through but simply to vote as they were told. Incredible as it may seem, the Deputy Chief of Staff, perhaps intuitively, turned out to be the closest of all to the truth. It was far quicker and more efficient for him to make decisions on his own than to have a crowd of people beating their brains out over these decisions a crowd of people who didn't have the opportunity to think. This conclusion is confirmed by the fact that none of the parties in the State Duma have put forward even a slightly articulate platform that the public can understand. The situation with the ideas and program already put forward by Anastasia offers the clearest evidence of the inability of the existing system to engage in independent decision-making. Anastasia's program has been supported by a great many people, and, as studies have shown, the overwhelming majority of these people lead a sober lifestyle and are inclined to reflection. Vast numbers of people in different parts of the country have overcome great challenges in their efforts to implement this program. On the government level, however, there are people who seem incapable of even seeing what is going on in the public arena. Not only that, but counteraction has begun which has served to highlight precisely the influence foreign powers have been exerting on Russia, and the fact that the country is far from being under the control of its own government. This counteraction, of course, does not come from the, from the ranks of the priests who plan out programs for centuries and millennia to come. It is simpler and more specific, and arises from the current system of world order in which Russia has been assigned to the role of a supplier of raw materials for the West and a market for its subs substandard merchandise. By the West, I do not mean the ordinary people of Europe or America. I'm talking about a group of transnational companies and financiers who are interested in their own profits. As we can all attest for ourselves, over the past decades, their plans have been implemented at an alarming rate, while our rulers, to say the least, have done nothing to prevent this implementation. This is another fact clearly testifying to their lack of any kind of true power or authority. The only counteraction to the destruction of the state and the annihilation of a significant part of its population is the program put forward by Anastasia. But, the majority of my readers might reasonably argue, why do you continue to appeal to those who have no power and are incapable of changing anything? I shall respond. 1. I am appealing, after all, not only to the authorities, but in the first instance to you, dear readers, in the hope that our combined efforts will enable us to understand the situation we find ourselves in, in the hope that this situation will come out in your interpretation in Family Chronicles. This is an absolutely vital step. Otherwise, not only we, but our children too, will have an un enviable future to look forward to. 2. I remember Anastasia's question, but who is to blame for the lack of acceptance of truth? The one who does not accept the truth, or the one from whom he receives it? I think that I am partly to blame for the lack of sufficient governmental support offered to those who have begun to set up their domains. I was not able to express the idea in a language government officials could understand. Sure, we all speak the same Russian language, but different segments of the population use it differently and attach different interpretations to words. In short, I am unable to express myself in a language government officials understand. The President's administration, the government, and the Duma are all comprised of people just like you and me. They too have children, wives, and grandchildren, for whom, as would any other parent, they wish a bright future. And if they should prove capable of understanding the situation, they will gain true power and will be in a position to significantly influence the positive processes taking place in our society. But where and how can we find the words capable of putting an end to this vanity of vanities? We must look. Otherwise, new politicians will appear and will come up against the same system blocking their thought. 
Hence, I am appealing to you, my readers, with a request to find together the words which will be understood by the various segments of our society. And so, for the umpteenth time, I stand my ground and appeal to our president and government. To the president and government of the Russian Federation. As supreme ruler of the Russian state, you are undoubtedly more interested than anyone else in the prosperity of our country. Like any head of state, you would like to be recognized by the public for having left the brightest of all possible legacies during your tenure in office, namely laying a foundation for the prosperity of our nation and its people. Similarly, every Russian family desires to shape its life and daily routine in a manner worthy of human existence. And every mother who bears a child dreams about a happy future for her offspring, realizing that such a future is possible only when the nation as a whole is heading in a clear and predictably good direction. It is on this premise that you are endeavoring to build our national institutions, our government, our ministries, and our regional authorities. Nevertheless, no matter how sincere your desires and the endeavors of our state apparatus may be, our country continues to be plagued by corruption, drug addiction, prostitution, juvenile crime, and many other social ills. Our environmental and demographic situation is becoming hopelessly entangled. Families are falling apart. The country's overall population is in daily decline. We as a people are simply dying out. Everything you are doing is extremely important. The consolidation of the vertical power structure, the reorganization of the state apparatus, the reform of the military, the doubling of the GDP in the economic sector. All our national indicators are on the plus side. The dynamics are positive, but the public doesn't feel it. The people of our country, our neighbors, colleagues, and co-workers, relatives, parents, and children are all finding it more and more difficult to understand each other, to find kind and sympathetic words to say to each other, to build their mutual relationships on the basis of honesty, decency, and trust. Fear for tomorrow, for the future of their children, shows no signs of letting up. Are not these the most important indicators to consider? We see signs of an increasingly active struggle against social ills, but these ills are not abating. Why not? Why do the people's desires and the president's endeavors not correspond with what is happening on the ground? Isn't it time we all faced the truth squarely in the eye and came to the conclusion that we are struggling merely with effects and not with their underlying causes? Isn't it time for you to openly admit that our country is playing host to an ideology foreign to our society and realize that there are certain definite forces underlying many of our ongoing social ills? As a professional KGB man, you couldn't help but be aware of this. These forces have made such fools of our people that we are beginning to suffer from tunnel vision. Take a simple example, advertising. Both learned psychoanalysts and ordinary people will tell you that mass advertising is nothing but a device which exerts a powerful influence on the human psyche. With the aid of this device, people in many countries can be persuaded to consume food products which are harmful to their health, or wear uncomfortable clothing, or vote for certain politicians. And this device, which can exert a colossal influence, influence on masses of people, seems to be in your hands, the hands of our national government. Isn't that so? Most definitely not. It is actually subject to other masters. Attempts to bring resolution to this question immediately will give rise to accusations of violating freedom of speech. These accusations come from those who actually have no interest whatsoever in promoting people's freedom of speech. The mass media are, in fact, in the hands of the world's financial magnates. And they keep spreading this monstrous lie among whole populations, hiding be behind the cynical excuse that it is advertisers who support all TV and all the interesting programs we so love to watch. But in fact, TV is not paid for by any advertisers. All they do is pass on a portion of the money they collect from the public. 
which they build into the cost of their products in order to pay for their advertising on TV, radio, public transport, and the street. Thus, it turns out that the public collectively are the real supporters of TV operations. Every time they purchase substandard consumer goods and food products containing chemical additives, they support mediocre and downright shoddy TV programs and soap operas which keep promoting the image of man as a manically preoccupied Neanderthal. The Science of Imagery and Who Governs the Country's Ideology Throughout history, national ideologies have been created through devices which exert an influence on human society through images, through the clandestine ancient knowledge of the science of imagery. Some of our learned chaps might object that there is no such science, but there is. And its existence is determined not by the will of academics, but by the very nature of man. Man is created to think, and thoughts turn into turn in turn form images. In recent times we are wont to associate the science of imagery with ancient Egypt. We learn from history how priests created images to liberate nation states or seize power over whole peoples. It was the same kind of knowledge that the SS troops attempted to master in Hitler's Germany or the KGB's Division 13 in Soviet times. Certain elements of this science are intuitively employed by modern pol political technologists in the West and more recently in our own country. Hence, the terminology, image making, way of life, way of thinking, a candidate's image. To the political technologists, it is quite unimportant what a candidate's inner aspirations are, what kind of man he is, whether or not he is good at his job. Money and the mass media help them create an image which will appeal to the public. And what people end up voting for in elections is not so much the man himself as the image created for him by the political technologists. It won't be long before we'll all be voting for cardboard cutout politicians and a paper mache president. As for the shaping of images of whole nation states and their peoples, these are the masterpieces of an incomparably higher rank species of political technologists. Centuries of human history have borne witness to a host of examples of controlling a nation state through images. The most salient and obvious example for people today of the work of these top ranked political technologists or modern priests may be the history of our country and its people over the past century. We all know about the downfall of the Soviet Union, one of the mightiest empires in the world. But what preceded the formation of the USSR and what gave rise to its subsequent collapse? Precedent to the formation of the USSR was the creation of an attractive image of a socialist future and then of a communist state. Landowners and manufacturers were cast in the image of bloodsuckers of the pro proletariat. The Tsar still reigned in Russia, and the monarchy seemed unshakable. Yet, at the same time, an image was at work which was busy attracting followers. And these, in turn, found all sorts of ways to bring down the monarchy and create a new state. In the new image, the fall of the USSR was also preceded by the creation of an image. An image of the country as a totalitarian state along with a discussion on the need to replace it with a new one, a happy, free, democratic state along Western lines. The government and leaders of the communist state were cast in the role of bloodthirsty thugs trampling on freedoms and on the people themselves. The socialist order was painted as intolerable and leading nowhere. The image of communists created by the theater and cinema directors, actors, and artists on which whole generations of the populace had been raised was now summer, summarily shunt, shunted aside. But what was there to take its place? The resulting vacuum began to be filled with images of flourishing businessmen, gangsters, prostitutes, and Hollywood starlets. Our young people strove to imitate their habits and morals. There's no disputing the fact that material wealth is fast becoming the criterion by which prosperity is measured. Who attains it and how, that doesn't enter into the picture. 
The need to build a developed democratic state has been proclaimed to all, but not a word has been or is being said about the insurmountable problems in other democratic countries. Drug addiction, colossal corruption, environmental degradation, mental depression, decline in birth rate, and a whole lot else besides. Women naturally refuse to have children when they see no future for their offspring. Never mind that people in democratic countries have no clear picture of their own future. Our modern priests find it necessary to present democracy on its present form as the only acceptable order for the structuring of human society. Why? Because the conditions of democracy as we know it make it the easiest system to control. It is all too easy to hide behind freedom of speech, freedom of business, freedom of choice, and meanwhile, throw the public a black lie. And this is done not by happenstance, but deliberately and with considerable forethought. Whatever image you latch onto, you yourself will become. These political technologists know what will happen next with the whole population. It's not a difficult task to determine who's behind the disaster happening, disasters happening in Russia. All one has to do is track where the country's precious human and financial resources are being siphoned off to each time. The huge flood of immigration which fled Russia following the 1917 revolution took with it not only a significant amount of capital along with historical treasures and traditions, but most importantly, human resources. After the collapse of the Soviet Empire, a combination of reforms and a tempting image of prosperous civilized countries siphoned off and continues to siphon off our financial and intellectual resources. The saddest part is that the latest image of our state is being summoned in the interests of annihilating the whole country and the peoples living therein. No military intervention required at all. A more significant force than military weaponry is at work here. An image is at work. A combination of factors already perceptible to an analyst has been put into operation. Quite a simple combination at that. Let's try to reason through it. What are we building today? Where are we heading to? The political technologists tell us they are building a democratic state on the Western model. And so, once it is built, we shall be rich and happy. But millions of our fel fellow citizens quite reasonably argue, if there already exists on the earth developed states that are both democratic and happy, then wouldn't it be easier simply to go and live there now? And millions have it, have left, and continue to leave for Germany, Israel, and America, putting their intellectual and financial capital at the disposal of these countries and they become slaves there. The image is working. But what about those left behind in Russia? What are they to do? Build a developed democratic state and become rich, says the image. But what can a traffic cop say do to build such a state, or a sales clerk in a store, or a civil servant in an administrative office? That's not clear to many people. Neither is it clear how one is supposed to become rich on a salary of three to 5,000 rubles a month. But quite a number, after all, have somehow managed to wa wangle their way through. They drive around in expensive cars, build themselves luxury mansions, and holiday at fancy resorts. Somehow they've wangled their way through. And now the whole country is beginning to follow their example. Sales clerks and customers, traffic cops and office administrators, army officers and private soldiers, teachers and students. But those who know the science of imagery merely scoff at such efforts. Come on, they say, catch a few scapegoats am among the officers' ranks. Then you can create a security service with within the security service. Here we are fighting not against causes but against effects. The image has already done its work. It is capable of entering unhindered into the minds of politicians and generals high-ranking government officials and ordinary people. Because it is image, it knows neither border guards nor closed office doors. It lures young girls from isolated Russian villages to faraway lands with its promises of a happy life. 
and then forces them to work as prostitutes in Cyprus, Israel, or New York. For the sake of this promise of a happy life, officials are ready to take bribes and policemen go into cahoots with criminals. This image has tremendous energy. In the meantime, all our politicians can do is keep mouthing over and over hackneyed phrases like developed democratic countries, the civilized West, thereby serving to reinforce the image that is so destructive to our country. People are aware there's something wrong with the country, and so they understand when you, Vladimir Vladimirovich, attempt to impose order. But how to accomplish this? Just consolidating your hold on power is not enough. In doing this, you are strengthening not just your own power, but the power of the image too. Thousands of government officials now have more power, but being under the influence of the image, they will unwittingly act in the interests of the image, i.e. in the interests of the image's creators. But the creators have already decided that Rus Russia's fate is sealed. Their actions have become unbridled and brazenly bold, Specially trained personnel have been sent to Russia for the purpose of strengthening the creator's power by supporting an image which can only destroy the country. I can officially state that right at this moment, specially trained people are operating on Russian territory, people whose job it is to keep track of and to correct, where necessary, the ideological component of the state. I have a feeling you, Mr. President, are aware of this too. Let us give some thought as to why there have been so few positive images over the past few years in our nation's literature, film, and TV programs. Images capable of inspiring people, setting a pattern to follow, and helping build a marvelous future for their children. We still remember and live by those images, but our children? We are assured that this is the demand of the majority, that everybody wants to watch only Hollywood starlets, gangsters, showdowns, and sensational reports on bloody happenings. Nonsense. That is not what people want. We are told if you don't want it, then don't watch. If you don't like it, don't listen. That is called freedom of choice. But that's not quite the way it is, or rather, that's not the way it is at all. There is no choice here, not for children, not for adults, and certainly not for senior citizens. And unless you happen to be cold-hearted, cynical, and soulless, you'll discover the road to the promised prosperity is blocked, and there is no other road that... And there is no other road. Isn't that the case all around you, or all around us? All this depravity is being deliberately foisted upon us. Special covert selection mechanisms were put in place long ago. Any poets, innovative, innovative educators, writers, and directors who have dared create positive images for Russia are cruelly persecuted. Everything is simply closed to them. This is partly the work, too, of Western spy agencies that claim to be fighting sectarianism. You can hear such declarations coming from the mouths, not just of, of Russian special service agents, but from social and political activists as well, including the highest officials of the Russian president's administration, your administration, for example. Mr. Surkov, your deputy chief of staff, said during a newspaper interview, a secret war is being waged against Russia by circles in America, Europe, and the Orient who still regard our country as a potential enemy. They consider themselves to have rendered a service in fostering the virtually bloodless collapse of the Soviet Union. And now they are attempting to capitalize on their success. Their goal is none other than the destruction of Russia and the filling of its vast spaces with a multitude of petty quasi-states. Such a statement is entirely plausible. Even if, just because the forces that overthrew the USSR still exist, and quite naturally, not satisfied with having achieved victory at one stage, they will definitely continue with a stepped-up offensive. And it is especially important not here, not just to state facts, but to understand the mechanism by which the destructive influence operates. We already know that the collapse of the USSR was brought about not through armed invasion, but as the result of an ideological manipulation of our people. 
Ideology, that is, the principal means of either annihilating or reinforcing any nation-state. But an ideology can be used to influence masses of people if it has a well-built and efficient operating structure. It exists, and it is not ours. It is not our image that are acting through it. But where has our own structure disappeared to? We destroyed it. In the USSR, apart from its ideological institutions and broadcast centers, the ideological departments of the Communist Party Central Committee, the Ministry of Culture and the Press, there was a huge network including so-called palaces of culture and houses of culture, along with urban and rural district activity clubs. Such institutions afforded the opportunity for millions of young Soviet citizens to engage in amateur artistic and performance circles, including the holding of lectures and meetings, as well as the opportunity for the accepted state ideology to get through and be explained to the masses. At the beginning of Perestroika, when the ideology changed, this network of institutions was liquidated. Their financing was cut off. It is difficult to imagine that a driver monitoring along the highway who suddenly realizes he is heading in the wrong direction instead of turning around and heading the right way begins to dismantle his car on the spot when the decision was taken in society not without the aid of certain forces of course that we were heading in the wrong direction instead of turning around and using existing institutions they were simply dismantled and what was there to take their place it was proposed to hand over the basic task of spiritually educating the population, especially the youth, to Russia's Orthodox Church. However, more and more testimonies are indicating that, first and foremost, it is necessary to educate the majority of the clergy itself. As an institution of spirituality, Russia's Orthodox Church was a catastrophic, was catastrophic in its failure to justify the hopes placed in it. Why? Simply because, through the help of the state, it only took a few years to open 20,000 churches, while it requires centuries and a host of strict conditions to educate 20,000 highly spiritual clerics who are truly capable of comforting and educating other people. And not the kind of conditions as when the state pours forth grants and favors, which only corrupt and attract opportunists and vagabonds. In that scenario, the winners are not those pastors who are rich in spirit, but those who are more devious and position themselves closer to the trough. It is not the congregation led by a spiritually minded prior that comes out on top, but the one that manages to obtain financing. After all, the process of attracting parishioners and raising their level of spirituality is a lengthy one. It can drag on for years, so the village priest is obliged to mend his own frock, unable to afford a new one, while his urban counterpart, counterpart drives around in an expensive foreign car. This acquisitiveness and covetousness already plaguing the clerics of Russia's Orthodox Church was brought up during a speech at the annual meeting of the Moscow Diocese in the Cathedral Church of Christ the Savior on the 15th of December 2004 by Alexei II, the Holy Patriarch of Moscow, and all the Russias, when he said, Today we are obliged to confront a series of negative phenomena, including the general static state of the Church's activity, the absence of dynamics in the congressional life, the low attendance by worshippers at temple service, and the lack of interest in religion on the part of the rising generation. The growing commercialization of many aspects of congressional life is an alarming indicator of the dying out of the orthodox consciousness, spiritual blindness, and the disparagement of ecclesiasticism. Material self-interest all too often comes to the fore, overshadowing and stamping out everything living and spiritual. All too often temples deal in church services as though they were commercial firms. Nothing pushes people away from the faith as much as the selfishness of priests and others who serve in the temples. It is with good reason that covetousness ha is termed a hateful, murderous passion, 
and the only treason, treason in respect to God, in other words, a hellish sin. The patriarch outlawed, over, outlawed taking payments for performing church sacraments, the rituals of communion, marriage, last rites, and burial services, as well as commercializing the services of the church. But will clerics heed the ban imposed by the supreme church hierarchy if they already transgress a higher law, the commandments of God? Russia's Orthodox Church, but is it Russia's? Apart from everything else, Western spy agencies have exerted what may be the strongest and most destructive influence on Russia's Orthodox Church, ROC. And this could have been foreseen, of course, if someone had only been assigned to foresee it. We know that major shifts in our country are always preceded by an ideological makeover. Could the departments of Western spy agencies responsible for the transformations in Russia, required by their masters, leave untouched such an important institution as ROC? Of course not. Otherwise, their work would not be professional. Besides, the conditions in Russia at the time offered more than fertile ground for ideological diversion. Occupied with their own reorganization, our spy agencies, to put it mildly, were busy with their internal settling of accounts, which I believe is still going on. It is impossible to know about every single operation per perpetrated by, the West by a Western spy agency through ROC structures, but one in particular has struck a chord in society as a whole. Millions of Russians, Russia citizens, including the church's own clerics, have felt and continue to feel its destructive con consequences. I'm talking here about the agency formed under the aegis of ROC, which labels as sex a wide range of secular and religious organizations, thus provoking negative reactions to ROC on their part. These anti-sectarians have been acting in the name of the church and even, as they claim, with the blessing of Patriarch Alexei II. In response to their actions, people who formerly maintained a tolerant attitude toward the church or even attended services as baptized members have now simply torn off the crosses they used to wear around their necks. One more ploy of the anti-sectarians in working, in working to expose their straw man sects they virtually criticized and brought shame upon Russia's Orthodox Church itself, dealing it a serious blow. After that, they decided to take control of the higher organs of state power in the Russian Federation. Having accepted the idea of a marvelous future for Russia, as shown in these books, with their heart and soul, people in various parts of Russia have turned and continue to turn to local administrations asking them to grant them plots of land for the setting up of family domains. And, what is truly amazing, people, for the first time, are not asking for favors or salary or pension supplements, but simply a small piece of their country's natural landscape where they can create their own living, and not just survival, conditions. It would seem that this impulse which has arisen among the public is something that ought to be welcomed with open arms, and this impulse is no fly-by-night whim, but a, a lasting, well-thought-through desire, as the past four years will attest. This idea has encompassed various segments of the population, school pu pupils, scholars, and entrepreneurs, teachers, doctors, and pensioners, soldiers and politicians, artists, poets, and writers, including academics, governors, and the wives of presidents of former Soviet republics. These people can help not only in solving many of the socio-economic problems in our country's facing, but also in making drastic improvements in our country's demographic situation, unemployment rate, and national health, as well as in securing safe food supplies. But the main thing is to harness the mighty force of the people themselves, who, in creating their own space, will strengthen their beloved country and nation-state which has afforded them the opportunity to do so. Evidently, however, there is someone who is greatly displeased by these positive aspirations which have emerged in the Russian people. 
Occupiers in Action. Certain government agencies at the regional and sometimes even local level have been advised to treat the readers of my books as sectarians and terrorists and consequently to counteract any initiative they may undertake, especially those wishing to set up their own family domains in rural areas. The mass media were ordered under threat of sacking journalists not to report on these initiatives. Or, if they were were any reference, it would have it, it had to describe them as part of the loony fringe, calling everybody to go to the forest, back to the past, etc. People working in the cultural sector were called upon to take countermeasures against anything connected with the books or the ideas set forth therein. Communications from readers clearly point to the activities of some sort of organization operating on our national territory through agents in state and ecclesiastical structures and carrying out destructive policies. And don't just take my word for it. This is confirmed by professional researchers who have familiarized themselves with a significant body of collected materials. A special term has even surfaced, the Anastasia cult, and to whom or to what does this term specifically refer? To me as a writer? To my Anastasia book? To the book's heroine, whose name is Anastasia? To the millions of readers of these books? Or to their efforts to implement Anastasia's idea about a marvelous and prosperous Russia? As it turns out, all of the above. It is a sad sight indeed to see both foreign and homegrown clerics who are definitely not of any Christian faith, occupying the Orthodox Church and exerting their influence on state officials. Christianity for them is only a convenient cover. Their actions show clearly that they are far removed from any Christian morality. Their methods are old hat, the same methods of falsehood and violence that were used to destroy the culture of ancient rust in favor of new ideology foreign to the people. I have written about this in my books. Right off, they began accusing me of paganism. But what kind of accusation is that? It's tantamount to accusing me of the desire to know the history of my country and the culture of my forebears. There is, however, some very happy, encouraging news. Life has begun more and more often to come out with situations where their unseemly actions are exposed as if by an invisible ray of light. It puts them, one might say, in a rather funny predicament. Judge for yourselves.